My fellow Americans, before getting into today's subject, I would just like to say a heartfelt word of thanks to all of you for the thousands of wires and calls that have come in supportive of the actions of the last few days, and particularly supportive and grateful to those young men in uniform who are performing so magnificently. Now today, I'd like to talk about a very important decision that was made Thursday by the defense ministers of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, as it's commonly called. This decision has great importance for us and for the NATO alliance as a whole because it addresses the future size and composition of our shorter-range nuclear forces in Europe. As you know, we're negotiating with the Soviets in Geneva on the longer-range missiles. The current imbalance on those systems is over 350 to zero in their favor. But with regard to the shorter-range missiles, the tactical missiles, I think you'll be very pleased with today's news. But first, a little background. The nuclear forces in Europe are fundamental to our overall strategy of deterrence and to protecting our allies and ourselves. The weapons strengthen NATO and protect the peace because they show that the alliance is committed to sharing the risks and the benefits of mutual defense. Just by being there, these weapons deter others from aggression and thereby serve the cause of peace. Unfortunately, we must keep them there until we can convince the Soviets and others that the best thing would be a world in which there is no further need for nuclear weapons at all. The Alliance's goal, as General Rogers, NATO's Supreme Allied Commander for Europe, has so often said, is to maintain no more military forces than are absolutely necessary for deterrence and defense. In December of 1979, NATO reached a decision to reduce immediately the number of shorter-range nuclear weapons stationed in Europe. In 1980, we carried out that decision by removing 1,000 of these weapons. The same decision also committed the Alliance to a further review of the remaining systems of this category, and that brings us to our decision of Thursday. Drawing on the recommendation put forward by a special high-level study group, the NATO defense ministers decided that in addition to the 1,000 nuclear weapons which we withdrew in 1980, the overall size of the NATO nuclear stockpile could be reduced by an additional 1,400 weapons. When these 2,400 weapons have been withdrawn, the United States will have reduced its nuclear weapons in Europe by over one-third from 1979 levels, and NATO will have the lowest number of nuclear weapons in 20 years. What this means is that the Alliance will have removed at least five nuclear weapons for every new missile warhead we will deploy if the negotiations in Geneva don't lead to an agreement. This step, taken by the Alliance as a whole, stands in stark contrast to the actions of the Soviet Union. The Soviet leaders have so far refused to negotiate in good faith at the Geneva talks. Since our 1979 decision to reduce nuclear forces, the Soviet Union has added over 600 SS-20 warheads to their arsenal. Coupled with this, they offer threats and the acceleration of previous plans, which they now call countermeasures if NATO carries through with its deployment plan intended to restore the balance. The comparison of Soviet actions with NATO's reductions and restraint clearly illustrates once again that the so-called arms race has only one participant, the Soviet Union. On Thursday, NATO took a dramatic and far-reaching decision, a decision that puts us a giant step along the path toward increased stability in Europe and around the world. As we reduce our nuclear warheads in Europe, and of equal importance, take the necessary actions to maintain the effectiveness of the resulting force. We will continue in the future what we've accomplished so well in the past, to deter Soviet aggression. We seek peace and we seek security, and the NATO decision serves both. Now, let me bring you up to date on the negotiations in Geneva. Progress toward an equitable, verifiable agreement on the reduction of intermediate-range nuclear missiles has been slow to come. Most recently, I proposed three initiatives which go a long way toward meeting important concerns expressed by the Soviet Union. By our actions in the talks, we have ensured that all of the elements of a mutually advantageous agreement are on the table. The Soviet Union has now advanced some additional proposals of its own. We'll study these proposals and we'll address them in the talks in Geneva. Unfortunately, the Soviet proposals permit them to retain SS-20 missiles while not allowing NATO to deploy its own. The proposals are also coupled with an explicit threat to break off the Geneva talks. I hope that the Soviet Union is truly interested in achieving an agreement. 
The test will be whether the Soviets, having advanced their latest proposals, decide finally to negotiate seriously in Geneva. For our part, we continue to seek an equitable and verifiable agreement as quickly as possible. We will stay at the negotiating table for as long as necessary to achieve such an agreement. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.
Also a suspicion now. We knew that the workers on that airplane were probably reservists. They were the military as well as workers. And there were only several hundred of them, but we suspect that that Russian ship had come in with supplies a few days before and then gone out to sea and just dropped anchor. That it possibly brought in with the two battalions because we ran the real resistance was from the 
and were, there's no question they were trained with military. And now there's about 300 of them or so they show up in the field. I think maybe you all would be interested to know too about the top brass inside this. That they're the top priority in the planet was minimize and possibly eliminate the possibility of cancer. <laughs> and I think if it hadn't been for this little extra organization of human we possibly could have primary concern. Thank <laughs> you. 